Hello Toastmasters and most welcome guests. I am Mandy Davis and I represent Stevenage Speakers Club in Hertfordshire in England. I am delighted to be here with you today. I'm very, very excited about introducing the person who's going to be speaking to you. He has been the only European international president of Toastmasters International in almost a hundred years of its existence. I can't believe there's only been one. Isn't that exciting? There has to be more out there waiting. We never know. He was born and bred in Kerry, so I believe that makes him a Kerry man, although he's not there now. He is with us. So please may I present to you Ted Corcoran. Uh, thanks, Mandy, for introducing me and welcome everybody to the District 71 conference. I hope you're enjoying it so far. My presentation is entitled How to Write a Speech in 10 Minutes and people say, no, that's impossible. You can't write a speech in 10 minutes. Well, hopefully by the end of 40 minutes, you will have some idea how to do so. But before I go to my next slide, I want to ask you a question. Why do people give speeches in the real world, not so much in Toastmasters where people are practicing, but in the real world, people give speeches because they have some ideas or some information or some emotions they want to convey to their audience. So it's about communication. But this is what George Bernard Shaw, the famous writer said about, about communication. He said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion it has taken place. In other words, it's an illusion if you don't, if you don't make your speech travel across to your audience. And simplicity always beats complexity because simple means your audience hears it and, and gets the idea. So the key question then is, are you a competent talker or are you a competent communicator? I see competent talkers all the time. I belong to the Rotary Club of Dublin. We have guest speakers and they are very competent talkers. Very few of them are competent communicators. Warren Buffett said famously, if you can't communicate, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Doesn't travel, winks don't travel in the dark. And I put in, of course, a girl winking at the boy in the dark has the same outcome no communication. So here's a, effective communication is a key skill. And here's a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. The imparting are the exchanging of information by speaking, writing, or using some other medium. The definition of communication skills is the ability to convey or share ideas and feelings effectively, again by the Oxford Dictionary. So here's the key question. It's not how much you know about your speech subject, but rather how much your audience understands and remembers your subject stroke message when you're finished speaking. So if when you're finished speaking, if you ask the audience to score how much they know about your subject matter, would they give you a one, which is very little, or a 10, very high? A one would be talking, 10 would be communication. So today's goal is to change your mindset with the difficulty of writing speeches. To show how you can structure a speech that communicates your message. And to do that, I'm going to cover these four, four um, parts. The three requirements for an excellent speech, three questions to ask before you start, the importance of flow in every speech, and finally, the nine prime plan. So, the very first one, something to say, confidence to deliver, and the technique to connect with the audience. We deal with each one in turn, something to say. Subject matter isn't important while you're learning the process of writing speeches. So many people say, oh, I have to write something important. I was at a function in Victoria on Vancouver Island 
maybe 10 years ago, seated at a banquet beside a lady who I had not seen or heard or spoken. I got engaged in conversation. I said, how long are you a Toastmaster? She said, three years. Oh, I said, you must be a disti distinguished Toastmaster then. Oh, no, no, she says, I've only done three speeches. I said, three speeches in three years, what's keeping you? Well, she said, I can't get anything important enough to write a speech about. Oh, I said, oh, I understand. And when you do get this important subject and you write the speech, will the local television station call and, and, and record it? No, she says, why would they do that? I said, when it's finished, will it be taken down the local library for generations coming in the future to read it? She said, no, why would they do that? I said, well, why has it to be about something important? This is a big mistake by a whole lot of people. They can't, they can't find something important to write a speech about. You can write a speech about anything, and when you're beginning, about anything actually works. For example, your mother sent you for piano lessons. You come home after the first lesson, and, and she asks you how you got on, and you say, as a child, well, I'm doing Chopin's Concerto Number no. 1 in E minor next week. That's a bit unlikely, isn't it? After one lesson. So don't complicate things by trying to write speeches about very difficult subjects. Look what Helen Keller said. True teaching cannot be learned from textbooks any more than a surgeon can acquire his skill by reading about surgery. The example I give here is Dublin has a fine football team and Mr. Farrell is the manager. So you want to play for the Dublin football team and you keep waiting until he phones you up and asks you to join the squad. You'll be waiting forever unless you practice and kick footballs and train and be fit all the time. So don't wait around, just do it. Confidence to deliver. Well, that's why people come to Toastmasters and they get this confidence because speech evaluations plus evaluation slips in, leads to increased self-confidence. And Toastmasters provides a safe environment. Nobody upsets people. Well, very rarely anyway. But are you speaking and communicating? Or are you just talking? Or worse still, waffling? Waffling is very common and easy to serve. And Wikipedia describes it as waffle is language without meaning, blathering, babbling. We move on to the technique to connect with the audience, which is the really important bit. And so many people join Toastmasters and they get the confidence and they get all this feedback, then they quit. But they still have not figured out the technique to connect with the audience. So it's what my audience hears, feels, understands, remembers, and acts upon. That's the question. That's the proof of communication. Does your audience hear it, feel it, understand it, remember it, and act upon it? That's communication. So we come to the five basic parts of every speech. The organization and purpose at the bottom, word usage and delivery at the top of the pyramid. There they are, organization and purpose, word usage and delivery. How often though are they put into practice? How often have you heard evaluations that go something like this? Well, I really liked your speech, but I think you spoke a little on the fast side. I suggest that you slow down and maybe pause a little bit more. Or about the body language. Well, you stood behind the lectern and you fiddled with your notes. And when you came out, you had one hand in your pocket. 
what's the elephant in the room? You know what an elephant in the room is, something that nobody talks about, but everybody knows it's there. No mention of organization and purpose, the pillar of every speech, organization and purpose. So I don't know whether you have any pets at home or have you elephants, but have you ever seen an elephant in a room? Probably not. So here's one for you. Now, I don't know who the poor unfortunate that he's sitting on is, <laughs> but uh, obviously that's the elephant in the room. So I want to give you an example of that. This gentleman meets a friend of his in a car park. And he says to this friend, he says, I'd like you to come and look at my car and give me your opinion on it. So the man goes over to the car and he says, oh yeah, I, I like it a lot. I love the color, it's red. I like that red. And it has beautiful black upholstery and, and it's two doors. I really like two door cars. And it has a hitch for towing a trailer and it has rear wipers. But I, I suggest that you perhaps wipe the front windscreen because it seems to be a little dusty and maybe you might replace one of the wiper blades. And the, the man says, well, thank you for the feedback. But here's the car. No wheels, zero wheels. Everything else is perfect. That's the evaluation that talks about everything except except the organization and purpose. Mentions everything, the color, the steering, oh, everything, but not the most important thing. So we have to, we have to talk about organization and purpose. And that's what will happen in later on in this presentation quite a lot. Because I see does not a cake make, not deliberately a speech. I say does not a cake make, not delivery a speech. See, this is what Darren Lacroix, who won the World Championship 20 years ago, says it doesn't matter. Just read it yourself. He says, our words may be brilliant, but if the intention behind them or the delivery of these words is not congruent, our words may fall in deaf ears. That's somebody that's talking, but it's making no difference to the audience. Have you ever said this to yourself? Are we there yet? Listening to a speech that drags on and on, goes here, goes there, goes everywhere. No organization, no sense of purpose. Are we there yet? I bet you everyone has sat at some meeting, whether it's in, in Toastmasters or outside, and you have said that. I went to a presentation here in a hotel in Dublin some years ago where there was this man who was a former Ukrainian nuclear physicist gave a presentation for 45 minutes. His first slide had 14 live lines and 14 words. And I said, oh my God, do you know that he read every single slide for the next 45 minutes that were exactly the same, read them out of paper that he had on the lectern? I thought I was going to die. Are we there yet? Here's two famous speakers, Martin Luther King, 28th of August, 1963, in front of the Lincoln Memorial, and John F. Kennedy at his inauguration. Two famous speakers. John F. Kennedy that day said, let every nation, let every nation know whether they wish us well or ill. We will pay any price, bear any burden, face any hardship, help any friend, oppose any foe to ensure the survival and the success of liberty. See, that's a speech. That's a speech. How do we communicate with people? Well, mostly through conversation with the written word and true speech. But here's the thing, the difference is crucial. In a conversation, you can ask me questions until you understand what I'm saying to you. I can ask you questions. We can figure it out so that we both leave 
but a mutual shared understanding of what we're telling each other. If I write you a page or two, how many times can you go and read that letter? You can read it a hundred times until you understand it. In a speech, how many chances do you get? And the answer is one, and one only, because then the speech goes off into the universe, never to be seen again. That's a hugely crucial difference between those three sides of communicating. And the speech one is the one that gets mixed up so often. So there are the three requirements for an excellent speech, something to say, competence to deliver, and technique to connect with the audience. So we move on now to three questions to ask before you start. So three critical questions. First question, who's your audience? What is your subject matter, message, or theme? Why are you saying it? Your purpose. Who is your audience? Well, that has an external audience and an internal audience. If it's an external audience, you're invited to go down to the local, whatever, community hall to speak about something. And if it's the older people's night out, you hardly talk about joining a football club. If you're speaking at, at, at your Toastmasters club about a subject that you're very conversant with, but the audience knows very little or anything, then you've got to stop telling them the detail because it won't be internalizing it. You've got to stick to the main points. So if you were talking to, let's say, your, your gym club about the benefits of exercise, you could go into detail because people know what exercise is and they have some competence in the field. In my Rotary Club, we have people most Mondays to speak. And they speak for 30 minutes about a subject we know nothing about and we know nothing about when they're finished. Why? Because they pile on the detail instead of the main ideas. What is your subject matter? Well, I, I, I've heard that earlier. Your subject matter when you're learning to write a speech can be about anything, anybody, any event, anywhere in the world, anything, because you're learning how to construct a speech and deliver it. What is your purpose? Your why? It can be to inform people. Very common, the most common. It can be to persuade people to do something. It can be to motivate people. It can be to inspire people. It can be to entertain people. And the difference between persuade and inspire is huge. You persuade people's rational sentence, senses, you inspire their emotions or their heart. If your speech has no clear purpose, there's no point in speaking, your audience won't get your message. This is what Dr. Smedley said, our founder. A speech without a specific purpose is like a journey without a destination. That's what he said all those years ago. A speech without a specific purpose is like a journey without a destination. This is what Dale Carnegie says. The talk is a voyage with a purpose that must be chartered. A man who starts out going nowhere generally gets there. And even if a man starts out knowing where he's going to get and he gets lost, he won't stop and get instructions because that's a man thing, okay? Specific purpose criteria. What do you want the audience to know, feel, act upon after your speech? Is the wording precise? The purpose should be realistic and possible to achieve. So after your speech, you could be, after my speech, people will know the importance of exercise. Or after my speech, people will know that it's, it's the, the, the charity down the street needs help. But it must be precise and it must be realistic and possible. So we dealt with who is your audience, what is your message, and what's your purpose. And we move on now to the importance of flow in every speech. Sorry. The importance of flow. Clear, open body, and conclusion. 
The ideas are arranged so they can be easily followed. Transitions act as signposts for the audience. Audience follows along throughout the speech. Flow is what makes listening to a speech enjoyable because you don't have to figure out what it's about, where's it going, where's it going to stop. You're kept in touch with the speaker all through. So here's an audience with complex ideas. Does the audience get it? No. With random ideas? No. With simple idea with a clear purpose? Yes. All the time. But how many times do you hear speeches with complex ideas or with random ideas in all directions? Your audience will not get it. Even Albert Einstein joined in. He says, you can't explain something simply. It means you don't fully understand it yourself. If you can't explain something simply, it means you don't fully understand it yourself, Mr. Einstein said. It's an acronym. And it's not keep it simple, stupid. It's keep it simple, speaker. Keep it simple, speaker. The audience will get it. Now, there's, there's, there's uh, two, two here in the succession. I'll show you the second one, which is uh, arrange ideas for the ears, but arrange flowers for the eyes. So if I take these three bunches of flowers and I give them to three separate people, one a child who's never arranged flowers, somebody, young man in his twenties who messes around with gardening and a professional florist and say, go away and come back in half an hour and I'll judge to see which are the nicest arrangement of flowers. You can bet that the professional florist will have the nicest arrangement. But, but why is that? Because they're the same flowers. Because the professional florist puts them in a sequence out of an arrangement that's pleasing to our eyes. We have to do the same for our ears. Signposts are as essential for your audience can follow your ideas and pieces of information. Why are there chapters in a book? Why are there paragraphs in a page? Have you ever tried to read a book with no chapters? Have you ever tried, tried, tried to read, say, 10 pages with no paragraphs? Almost impossible, unless you're James Joyce or something. But a speech is, is these ideas, like the flowers, that must be arranged. And the better the arrangement is, the better your chance of getting your ideas across to your audience. Now, this is a huge, hugely important piece of information. Because when you look at a page with your eyes, your eyes tell your brain, gives it information, makes sense of it. But when you're listening to a speech, your ears have to give your brain information so that the, your brain can make sense of it. And I bet you, you have sat through many a speech wondering, what is this speech about? Because it hasn't been made easy for you to make sense out of it. So we go on to the famous nine-point plan. How am I doing for time? 20 minutes, perhaps? Okay, nine point plan. So this is the speaking order of my nine point plan. You get attention. Number two is what is you going to talk about. Number three is you tell them what you want to tell them. The body is three points, one, two, three. Number seven is summarize. Eight is the message, your purpose, the why, the real reason why you've told them all the rest. And number nine is your call back to number eight, number one, sorry. But here's the secret. This is not how you write it. Speaking order is on the left, writing order is on the right. You start off with deciding, what is it I'm going to write about? And then you go straight down to number two on the right-hand side, why am I going to speak about this? And we'll go through each of those now in the next slides. So number one is the theme, the what. 
what is it? What subject am I going to talk about? Why am I going to give this speech? What do I want the audience to hear, feel, understand, remember, and act upon if necessary? Because if you can't answer that why, then whatever you write won't make any sense to the listeners. So what is the purpose of a speech? Well, this, we went through it already to inform, to persuade, to motivate, to inspire, or to entertain. What do you want the audience to do? To hear, to feel, to understand, to remember, and to act upon. So we go to the body. The body supports your conclusion. And it has, can be done in several ways. It can be categorical, so there's a fact and a fact and a fact. Or it can be time sequence, the past, present, and future. Toastmasters in the past was located in Orange County. It didn't have any computers. And then in 2003, it moved to the computer world. And today it's in Denver. And in the future, it will probably have locations all over the world. For example, that's just an example, past, present, and future. Or it can be a problem-based speech, which is, here's the problem, this is the cause, now this is the solution. Or it can be what Rudyard Kipling said all those years ago, I keep six, seven men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. You can write any speech by asking those questions. And what's more importantly, your audience will get it when you do. Now, this is what I call the preview. Tell them what you're going to tell them. You watch the news in Britain or Ireland any evening or night. They won't start off with the main story. They'll start off with story one, and two, three, four, and five. Why do they do that? So that we know what's coming. We we are giving a sense of anticipation what's coming. The same in a speech, you tell them what you're going to tell them. And there's various ways of doing it rather than saying three, I'm going to tell you three things, but you give them some indication of what's coming. So it's like a roadmap. You can follow easily along, like a roadmap for your speech. So if you bring friends out for a drive and you tell them we're going to, we're going to be passing A, B, C, D, and E on our journey, they will know as they come to these signs, that's where they are. Otherwise, they haven't a clue where they are. Same in a speech. And the summary is, tell them what you've told them, summarize, reinforce your, reinforce your argument. So that's the map. You review the roadmap you traveled. How clear were the signposts? How clear were the transitions? And then, and only then, you actually write the, the actual introduction, the first sentence. You get attention with a question, a story, a statistic. Get the audience's attention. Like all of these things, you can use questions, statistics, images. You call back to number eight for completeness. They call it the callback. So you, you in some way, mention where you started. This is a very holistic feel about it. You're bringing people on the journey in their minds with your speech, and then you bring them back to where, you, where they started. There's a great feeling of satisfaction in that. And actually journalists do it all the time when they're writing uh, opinion pieces. They, they ask a question at the start, and then in some way at the very last sentence, they'll refer to it again. Okay, so just just a referral back. So here we are. That's how it's right, written on the, on the right. And that's how it's spoken. So we dealt with all of these. Three requirements for an excellent speech, three questions to ask, the importance of flow, and the nine-point plan. This is what you learned today, how to use a nine-point plan to write a speech, the sequence, that as a beginner, learning the process of writing a speech is hugely important. It's not how much you know, but how much your audience hears, feels, understands, remembers, and acts upon. 
How are you communicating or just talking? We've learned that anyone can write a speech in 10 minutes and somebody will know. And that's me. So here we go. There's our nine points. I'm going to, I, I put this together a couple of hours ago. I'm going to talk about Dublin City. Now, we could write a speech about informing people about Dublin City. We could talk about famous people, we could talk about anything that would interest people. History is always interesting. We could inspire people about really great writers and poets like W.B. Yeats or Seamus Heaney or Samuel Beckett or, or our friend, our friend um, George Bernard Shaw. But I've chosen, I've chosen to persuade people to visit Dublin. So I've, I've, I've set out what I'm going to talk about. I've set out my purpose. I'm going to talk about three features, historical features, shopping, nightlife. So a wonderful place to visit, friendly people, guaranteed fine weather. <clears throat> uh, historical features, St. Patrick's Cathedral, 1191, Dublin Castle, 1204, Trinity College, 1592. Shopping, Grafton Street, Dundrum Shopping Centre, the Pavilions and Swords, etc., etc. Nightlife, pubs and bars, there are four very famous ones. Nightclubs. Copperface Jacks, that's the one I used to go to before I was barred for being rowdy. I, go, I now go to Yamimori Tengu because I like the oriental, oriental feel of it. Uh, <laughs> and of course, for the people who know me know that none of that is true at all. But for those of you who, who do not know me, you might believe it. Okay, so now we have four or five. Now we've got to go put in the preview, which is very simple. Number seven, which is very simple. Now I got to find a way of making it interesting. So there's a famous song about, uh, about Dublin written, I think in the last 30, 40 years, Dublin in the rare old times. And uh, it goes like this, ring a ring a rosy as the light declines. I remember Dublin city in the rare old times. So we make that, uh, uh, sorry, I, sorry, I should have fined in number eight first. Why not spend a weekend here, accessible by air, sea, road, and Shanks Mayor? So much to see or do. Please come and enjoy our city's many attractions. You won't regret it. Then we have the ring a ring a rosy bit. Now, how am I going to get back to number one for number number nine? Very simple. Finally, ring a ring a rosy as the light declines. So visit Dublin City and have a rare old time. And there's the speech. Done. Now, if you ask me to deliver it, I could by just expanding on each of those words, or some of them, some of them don't need any expansion. And all of a sudden, I have a five to seven minute speech and you'd be persuaded to visit Dublin, perhaps. So the title is ring a ring a rosy And then finally, because I had got to get back to where I started too with George Bernard Shaw, he says, life isn't about finding yourself, life is about creating yourself. And that's what Toastmasters helps you to do. Thank you for listening. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Ted. Another round of applause because I think that was absolutely marvellous. Thank you. I really got a lot out of that. Uh, my first question is the last one on this list and that is Will there be handouts? Is your PowerPoint available for us to take away? No, but it's recorded. It's recorded, that's yeah. good. I was trying to make notes all the time. Yeah. I got totally lost. It was it was fast, it was furious, and I wanted to hang on to every word. Well, normally I take about an hour for that, but I had to cram it into 30 minutes. <laughs> you did very well. <laughs> you did very well. So I, you, I lost out some of my stories, but, uh, but anyway. You got the you got the gist of it. You got the gist of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'm trying to find questions on this list that have not been answered by you anyway. 
I, I, one of the questions, can you prepare a speech in 10 minutes and make it memorable? Well, I think you did. <laughs> there you are. I, I mean, that, uh, that didn't take me 10 minutes this afternoon to put those words together because I used the formula, decided what the purpose was, picked, I could have picked any three things to talk about to visit Dublin, but it doesn't have to be everything you see because you've only got five to seven minutes. So any three things. Remember, you're learning how to write a speech, not not to actually sell it to Tourism Island. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is very true. This is very true. I'm also asked here. Um, it says again, you you've answered it. Does a speech written in ten minutes still need to be fleshed out to some degree? Yes. But, but, but here's the thing, you see, if you write down the ideas, like, for example, St. Patrick's Cathedral, 1191. The clergyman in St. Patrick's Cathedral was, was uh, what's his name? Um, the guy who wrote the Gulliver's Travels. Um, uh, oh. Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift. Swift. Jonathan Swift. So you could write, you could say a little bit about Jonathan Swift there, as, as he was a clergyman in, 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 and he wrote Gulliver's Travels in 1726 or something. So just that. Then you go on to, to, to Dublin Castle. Well, that was the seat of the English uh, rule in Ireland for centuries. And today it's where the president of Ireland gets in, in, installed as the president. And you go on then to, to the next one was uh, Trinity College. It's called Trinity College because it was one of three colleges, Oxford, Cambridge, and the one in Dublin, which was the Trinity of three. So you see, I've, I've expanded each of those three things by just a couple of sentences. Enough to tell you, but not to overwhelm you. Now, I then could go on and talk about being ejected from Copperface Jack's The Nightclub which is only a figment of my imagination, of course. <laughs> I never set foot in the door. <laughs> but, but you get the idea. You, put, you write down the ideas and you expand on them. You don't even have to write a speech because you just have it in front of you as, 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 as words. Just talk about them. It's the sequence that makes the difference. The sequence. Next question. Uh, next question. I'm trying to find questions here. Somebody said many have tried the 10 minute method, but can you do it in five? I could if I had I think, to, yeah. I think you probably did today. I really did. <laughs> I could. I mean, I mean, the two main things is to decide what you want, want to speak about. And the next thing is, well, why am I going to give the speech? Is it to inform, to persuade, to motivate, or to inspire, or to entertain? You must decide where you want to finish up. It's like getting into your car on a Sunday afternoon. I think I take the family for a drive, but I have no idea where I'm going to go. Well, then you don't go anywhere, do you? Just mess around. But if you said, I'm going to go to wherever, that's where you end up. You must, I, I have... you, you must know your destination in a speech to, to be able to write it in the first place and to make sense of it in the second place and to make it interesting to your audience in the third place. That's very sound, very sound advice indeed. Uh, TJ wants to know, ideally, how long should a speech be in order to keep people interested? Well, five to seven minutes is what we practice in, in, in Toastmasters. It took me a good few years to find out how could somebody speak for 30 minutes or 40 minutes and, and keep people interested. And then I saw Zig Ziglar, the famous Zig Ziglar, uh, somewhere at one of the conventions I attended in America. And he had, he had four, maybe four points in his speech, but he told stories to support them all. So the sto he told stories. So he had a point about, let's say, let's say I, I spoke about St. Patrick's Cathedral 1191. Well, I could talk about Jonathan Swift and I could talk about Gulliver's Travels and I could talk about the time I went there and I could so in other words I'm filling in more detail by telling stories rather than giving people information as 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 something to uh, to to store in their heads because there is this famous there are two famous sayings about stories one is facts f-a-c-t-s facts tell stories sell and the other one is make a point, tell a story. Make a point, tell a story. 
people can only remember so many points, but they will remember the stories for a long time. So I, when I do my keynotes overseas, as I've been doing the last several years, I have very few points, but I have a lot of examples and stories. Next question. Next question from Carolyn. Curious to hear from Ted about the value or importance of rhetorical tools, or should one stay with everyday conversation? Depends on the audience, doesn't it? It depends on the audience. I mean, if you were giving an inspirational speech about, about Dublin poets, and let's say you wanted to quote William Butler Yeats, one of the most famous pieces of poetry he wrote was, had I the heavens in brighter cloths, in wrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I being poor have only my dreams I will spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. That's because he was, he was disappointed in love. But you could, you could have these rhetorical, if that's what she means by rhetorical, uh, quotations and build a speech around it. I mean, there's a speech about William Butler Yeats, his life, where he was born, where he grew up, what he was famous for. Here are some of his poems. Another speech done, 10 minutes. You see, you see, you don't have to go around chasing the world for things. They're all around you. All around you. Uh, Jonathan Swift, speech about him. Gulliver's Travels. I mean, famous book. In fact, this is so famous that in the, the Guardian did a, a competition or a survey some years ago on the top 100 uh, English uh, novels. And Gulliver's Travels came third, number three. So how many speeches have I, have I now for you? I mean, they're just expanding in every direction. <laughs> Next question. Next question. Justin wants to know, are there other speech structures that are worth considering, especially when you enter international speech contests? There are people who win international speech contests, but they do not follow to the letter. That is, uh, obs uh, that is noticeable, but they all have, they all have a structure, and they ought, they all ought to have a message. And uh, I have seen every international speech final since 1992. I was only 18 at the time, and uh, uh, well, maybe 18 plus a bit. But but there's been a major change in the last maybe 20 years, 15 years, where it has become acting and dramat dramatization and yelling and all kinds of things. But the good news is that a group is working on reviewing the international speech contest ballot to make it more modern and to put the emphasis where it should be on speech organization, speech value, speech appeal, speech delivery. And I think that will revolutionize the speeches, not just at international level, but all through, because there are more and more people at club level getting into the circus acts and the antics and all of that. And the question I have for you is, where will you see that type of performance in real life, in the community, in politics, in sports stuff? You will never see that type of, of activity. It's not, it's not done anywhere else except in our contests. So if I get more royal now, I won't be able to sleep tonight. So ask me a nice question next. <laughs> I have a very much more general question, and it's interesting. It's from Paul, who's a new Toastmaster. And he would like to know if you could advise how often he should volunteer to speak within his own club and visit other clubs. As often as he can. You see, 
obviously, if he's in a big club, he'll get fewer chances because we have to be fair to everybody. But here's the thing. You know, if you're a religious sort, uh, the Christian persuasion, you'll probably have heard of the Holy Ghost, you know, he's, he's up there in heaven. And if you're a Toastmaster and you're waiting for the Holy Ghost to descend on you to do the speech for you, it's not going to happen, folks, okay? It's not going to happen. You're not going to get better by sitting back and waiting and waiting like that woman in Vancouver Island. You're only going to get better by actually doing it and learning from it. Provided that the people who are doing your evaluations don't do the, the car evaluation that I've just shown you, which is talk about all the airy fairy bits, but not about how the thing is put together, not about the organization, not about the purpose, not about the message, but, oh, you had your hand in your pocket, or you stood behind the lectern, or you blew your nose. These are only little, tiny little things that really don't make any difference because if you have an excellent organization, purpose, and a clear message, nearly everybody has adequate body language, adequate vocal variety, and a pretty good command of the English language. But here's the thing, no matter how extraordinary your body language and your voice is, it doesn't disguise a very poor organization and structure and purpose. So, you understand? If you, if you have all this good, but you have nothing behind it, it's still a bad speech. That's fair enough. I'm going to have to end the question and answer session because we are running out of time very fast. I have to say that that was one of the best presentations I've heard for a very long time. I got so much out of it. I'm really, really enthused by it all. And some of the quotes, I mean, your quote from, from Warren Buffett, I loved, absolutely loved, which I, I wrote back, which was great fun. I've lost my pieces. I've got so many pieces of paper here, look, all with writing on them, all the stuff I'm trying to remember from what you said. But uh, you can't communicate the you can't communicate if it's like winking at a girl in the dark. I love that. I thought that was great. Well, I felt, also, I felt, I felt a little bit non-PC for saying that, so I put in a bit about the girl at the bottom. You see, it's the same as the girl winks at the boy, so that I won't offend any of you ladies. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. And the other one I loved was not how much you know, but how much your audience remembers your message. That was the most important thing I think we got out of it today. Mm -hmm. I thought that was absolutely really worth making a note of. I had a great time. I'm sure the audience did too. You have been fantastic, Ted. Thank you very, very much. There are loads and loads of comments thanking you and telling you how wonderful you are. So everybody, a huge round of applause for our wonderful Ted Corcoran. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure. So are we done? We're done. The, the check is in the post. <laughs> the check is in the post. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, everybody. Um, the room will be closing in two minutes. You have got 10 minutes until the next event okay. on the main stage. You can go back to there's, Jerry, there's Jerry Dunn from Glasgow. You see him. Yes. And Murray <laughs> from uh, Dublin. And and, uh, we have, you had, Ms. Ted, you had 65, was it, um, 63 here on Zoom, and you had 155 on Wuva. So congratulations. Oh my goodness, over 200. You're over 200, yes. yes. Well. And there's somebody coming fantastic. very late, <laughs> a bit like the church you talked about earlier, a bit late, a bit <laughs> breathless, but coming in nonetheless. <laughs> Well, I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, I mean, there's one, it's great having a captive audience like you people, you see, I mean, I don't know whether you leave or not. So I just do my thing. Whereas if you're doing it in person, it's, well, when I do it in person, I, I involve the audience quite a lot, but you can't involve the audience in this type of Zoom thing. Okay, no. But, uh, Paul, that, Paul is me. asking when the, the recording will be available. Sarinka, do you have any information on that? I think it will be after this weekend our team of streaming and editing will be doing their work perhaps mm -hmm. we may need to call Ted back if we want him to redo any parts and then 
stuff will be posted on our YouTube channel, the D71. If you didn't like that channel yet, please go to YouTube, search for D71 and like the channel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, guys, we are at 10 to 8, so we're going to start closing down this room. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. <laughs> Please go back to your Hoover platform and click on the agenda to go to the opening ceremony. That's where I'll be. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we will see you there. From the back room. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Well done. No, oh, you can't leave now. No. no. <laughs> Down the bottom corner, Ted. You should have the option yeah. to leave the bottom right hand yes, corner. I, I'm pressing it. And it, it goes oh, bing. you're a co host. Oh, do we need to tick you off, Bing? Um, yeah. Okay, I'll end the meeting. So <laughs> I'm ending the meeting. So it won't shut abruptly in the face of anyone. I'm ending the meeting now. See you later. Bye. Bye. Yeah.